वेलकम टू एवरीथिंग इज एवरीथिंग आई एम अमित दिस इज माय गुड फ्रेंड अजय एंड टुडे अजय हैज अ वाइट स्माइल ऑन हिज फेस अजय व्हाई यू स्माइलिंग सो मच व्हाट मेक्स यू सो हैप्पी बिकॉज़ वी गॉट रिड ऑफ ऑल द क्लंकी बूम आर्म्स एंड स्टोन एज माइक्स एंड सच लाइक सो दिस इज शॉकिंग यू नो रियाद द फ्रेम इज अ लिटिल क्लियरर बट आई हैव द फीलिंग वन डे आई विल डिसअपीयर एंड यू विल बी इवन हैप्पीयर बट या वी डिड गेट रिड ऑफ देम बिकॉज़ वी नाउ हैव 32 बिट फ्लोट ऑडियो व्हिच यू वर सो एक्साइटेड अबाउट एज अ गीक केयर टू एक्सप्लेन टू आवर जेंटल रीडर्स व्हाट द हेल आर आई ओनली डिमली अंडरस्टैंड इट बट ऑल ऑफ अस हु हैव एवर डेल्ट विद अ माइक नो दैट यू कांस्टेंटली स्ट्रगल टू गेट द ऑडियो लेवल्स राइट and uh, these are magical mics discovered by amit this is the new state of the art mic by a firm called rode r o d e where uh, they capture the audio in 32 bit floats and uh, then there is absolutely no step of fighting to get the mic level right at the recording time and in post you can basically fix up the audio level and so we have got a new level of human freedom we can wave our arms around and there is no ugliness in front of us that is all the show was lacking you and me waving our arms about now we can wave our arms about this is road wireless pro just came out and mm. the sort of analogy i use is that 32 bit float for audio is like um, you know raw for photographs yeah. you know you can adjust exposure etc etc post facto it captures all the information is the same with this you're never going to have an issue with something being too loud and clipping and all of those issues are gone and i think about in this is something we were discussing the other day about what a miracle it is that so much of the technology that 20 years ago would have been prohibit prohibitive would not have allowed us to do what we are doing yeah. is now consumer grade is so cheap like all the podcasting equipment i use in my home studio and so on including those beautiful mics we were using the boom arms are ugly but the mics ATR 2100x close to my heart i will keep using them for podcasting the best dynamic mics and you know affordable for everyone you missed an opportunity to plug a german philosopher okay let me kind of what german philosopher is this what does immanuel kant's categorical imperative no, no. have to do Karl with Marx. this uh, this is about the proletariat owning the means of production okay so you <laughs> and i humble slaves and producers are no longer the subjects of the giant media companies here we are in the little world of Amit Bhai uh, Media Private Limited, where we have the complete means of production at our beck and call. And who says Emmanuel can't? Now Emmanuel can. And <laughs> let, let me, uh, you know, my favorite little story, which I have said on the scene and the unseen, but never on everything is everything. Just to talk about how technology has got so much cheaper in terms of the means of production is of an editing software called DaVinci Resolve. Now DaVinci Resolve today is one of the big three editing softwares. Uh, it does. great editing and it it does color grading now once upon a time it was known only for color grading but that was then state of the art and now it's even more improved but it wasn't free like today i have it free on my laptop and anyone can just download it for free there's a paid version but not necessary the free version is so awesome you can do the you know state of the art editing and the best color grading but once in 2010 when it was only color grading guess how much it cost it more than what most indian media companies would pay there wasn't one in india because it cost 800000 dollars for color grading so whenever and we we'll link to a great video on this where i learned this and i was like what what's happening how how is that possible 800000 dollars so when bollywood films would get their color grading done they would send it across to hollywood and it would come back and that would be you know a part of the cost because no one could afford to own it and they would kind of rent it out and uh, just like utterly uh, miraculous and uh, it's like someone would say so beautiful so elegant you're looking like a wow tell me about that shirt ajay sha oh um, the shirt this is art um we should aspire to surround ourselves with objects of beauty and great art has a way of lighting up your life these shirts are from indiancolors.com and uh, this is a unique organization which works with artists in india and pays them royalty so it's like the world of books where the author of the book gets a royalty so you have these beautiful shirts and backed up by a novel business model for the world of art 
and the best part about it is most of us can't afford to buy fancy art hanging on the walls who's going to spend lakhs but you know these people just license art put it on uh, merchandise like cups and stoles and shirts and all of that mm -hmm. and uh, anyone can surround themselves with art which yeah. i can see makes you very happy but yes. we will now have to move ajisha from a happy subject to a sad one sad speak for yourself Right so as you must have noticed in the last episode we said we are going to take multiple episodes to talk about um, you know the state the role of the state in society uh, and each time we are going to zoom in a little further and in the last episode we chatted about really two fundamental things one is the state is always coercive the existence of the state implies violence you know and that is a compromise that we make because we need it to protect our rights and so we are fine with giving away some of the rights giving the state a monopoly on violence as long as it protects our rights and that was the first part we discussed most people when they say the state should do this the state should do that they assume that uh, you know the state is a benevolent beast and there is no cost to their actions but even if the state does something that is putatively good the cost is it does it because of taxes that it takes to coerce violence and so on and so forth and so we should always keep into account not that there should be no violence because there's no option we need the state but we need to consider hard what the state does and every time we recommend you know that the state should do x or the state should, uh, should do y we should be able to justify it because each time we are justifying violence so why is this violence justified um, and and that is on the basis of what we should proceed and in the second part of the last episode we spoke about how we can use francis fukuyama's scale of uh, strength and scope that the scope of the state means all the things that a state really does and meddles into and looks after and all that and the strength is the efficiency with which it does it and the perfect state being a strong state that is limited in scope you're only doing what you're supposed to do you're not getting in the way of society solving its own problems but you're doing it really well india happens to have a weak state that does too much so it is the worst of both worlds and as you correctly pointed out what we should remember is that when we use the word strong we don't use it in a sense of strong man authoritarian decisive person he will get things done that is dangerous you need democratic processes and so on and so forth but we mean strength in the place of a robust system which can actually resist um any kind of uh, radical tendency at all because there might be radical tendencies you favor but there'll be many that you don't so you need those democratic processes in place and also when i talk of st strength i also mean strong in being able to enforce the rule of law which for most people in this country there is effectively no rule of law so that's my quick sort of potted summary of what we spoke about before i throw the stage to you okay let's carry this uh, forward uh out of the previous episode and this one we're building the basic toolkit on how to think about the state political philosophy and public policy and this is just a fabulous toolkit it is it's just an amazing piece of intellectual power to be able to look at the world through these eyes and it contributes great insight everywhere we look so we turn to the question point 3 which is what should the state do so we want a narrow scope of the state we fundamentally want a flourishing of human freedom but we know that the state is essential in certain things how do you draw those lines left to itself it could just become your philosophy versus mine or your political preferences versus mine and that's a very unsatisfactory state of affairs is there something that we can agree upon is there something that has a technical core that is sound and makes sense okay and here the economists have added tremendous value the economists have built out this framework called market failure which works like this so what they have figured out is step 1 that freedom is the baseline that by default human beings should be free human beings should do whatever they want human beings should swing their arms wildly and not be constrained by a boom arm required by a government regulator okay so freedom is the baseline then there is a class of situations where the pure freedom doesn't work out too well and what is the meaning of doesn't work out too well the economists have demonstrated that in this class of problems that is called market failure there is actually a way for the state to make some people better off without hurting anyone okay so it's very important to note we're not doing populism 
We're not taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. We're not doing Robin Hood. Market failure is a class of problems where there is an analytical and a technical possibility that the correct kind of state intervention is a free lunch because it will make some people in society better off without harming anybody at all. So that is really something all of us can agree on that, you know, you don't get into class warfare. It is the very opposite of the great German philosopher who claimed that the history of mankind is a history of class warfare. The market failure worldview is about using the state in ways that does not ignite class warfare. So if we can play this correctly and if we can do it correctly, there is a technical core. There are, you know, good analytical foundations which teach us that when there is market failure, there is an opportunity to design a state intervention that will make some people better off without harming anybody. Market failure in turn comes under four buckets. Okay, so one bucket is called market power where there is a monopolist or an oligopolist. Once again, there is a widespread populist view in the world that we hate XYZ because they are a monopolist, because they're rich, powerful people and we want to suck the fellows and we want to take away their money and we want to give it to other people. That's Robin Hood level thinking. That's not sophisticated. That's just populism. The economists know one better than that. The economists know ways in which everybody can be better off when the government interferes with the working of a monopoly in certain ways. And that is indeed a good thing all of us would be able to sign on, including the monopolist. Okay, So we are not being Robin Hood, we are not harming the monopolist. And by the way, alongside that, sometimes economists will say, you know, this is a natural monopoly and really we benefit as society from the cost cutting that comes with a natural monopoly and you want to regulate the price. But beyond that, you don't want to break up or mess with a natural monopoly. So we should not view this through a populist lens. We should not view this through the envy and resentment towards the powerful people. So that's pillar one of market failure. That's market power. Pillar two is externalities, where there is a channel of influence from me to you or you to me that we did not contract. Okay, externalities come in two kinds, positive and negative. In a positive externality, the classic one is, I get educated, I get vaccinated, you become better off. I get educated, invisibly, some knowledge spills over to you. I get a vaccine, invisibly, disease transmission to you goes down. We never contracted this. We never agreed that these benefits were going to flow. But there was a spillover. Now, market failure happens because... When I think about myself and my decision to buy a vaccine, my decision to get educated, I will not price your benefits. I'll only think for me myself. So I will tend to underinvest in education. I will tend to underinvest in a vaccine because I only care about myself. Okay. And that's a market failure that are we able to bring the interests of others to reshape my decision making? And that's the idea of a positive externality. Similarly, negative externalities. I smoke you get cancer. I play loudspeakers, I destroy your health and peace. Okay, This is clearly a problem. The entire criminal justice system is a negative externality story that the, my freedom to move my fist should be limited not just by the absence of the boom arm, but by the proximity of your nose. Okay, That is negative externalities that we use state power to limit negative externalities and everybody becomes better off. So that's externalities. The third is asymmetric information. It is not reasonable for you and me as a consumer to go into the market and buy a medicine and do our own testing and figure out that the medicine is pure. Okay, so purity of food, purity of medicines. Uh, this is a subject where there is a lot of value by government regulation. So the government will do the hard work of working with banks, pushing banks to make sure that there's a minimum level of safety. How would grandmothers and dentists know that my bank is sound? That's just an unreasonable ask of demanding that everybody understand what their bank is like. Everybody understand that this restaurant has a clean kitchen or that this restaurant does not use gutter oil. You know what is gutter oil? Okay, gentle reader, please Google gutter oil. It will blow your mind. Uh, so that's externality. And gentle reader, I suspect it will blow your guts as well. <laughs> but continue. I don't know what it is, by the way, but from your expression. Yeah. Um, um, no, don't tell me. Continue. Yeah. Hmm. It's it's just... Like, don't tell me. Don't yeah. tell me. Continue. Yeah. 
externalities. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the fourth is public goods. Public goods are a beautiful thing. Uh, they stand in technical jargon for things that are non-rival and non-exclusive. Again, the welfareist socialist impulse in India is anything that is good for the people is a public good. And that's just wrong. A public good is something that is non-rival and non-excludable. Non-rival means that my consumption of the public good in no way diminishes your consumption of the public good. So when one young woman like Nomsita walks on the streets and benefits from the public good of safety, it in no way diminishes the overall supply of safety. Okay, that's non-rival and non-excludable. It is not even in theory possible to exclude a newborn child from the glory of that public safety. Okay, that's a public good. That's the narrow definition of a public good. And there is a lot of abuse of these words. Um, I had done a podcast conversation with Vasan Dhar based on two chapters out of the Kelkaran Shah book, where I just have a fundamental objection to the digital public good because, you know, what is being done in India as the so-called digital public good is generally not a public good. It's rival and excludable. So, uh, public goods are, for example, clean air. Okay. Step one, my breathing of clean air in no way diminishes the amount of clean air in the world. Thus, it is non-rival. And second, non-excludable. It is not even in theory possible to exclude a newborn child from breathing that glorious air. So, the regulation of uh, putting particulate matter into the air all over North India is a public goods problem. And we would endorse the use of the coercive power of the state to tax the people, raise money, build organizations that will put 10,000 drones all over the sky in the Hindi heartland, find every fire and send the police to block every fire and give a ticket to each person lighting a fire all over North India. Okay, that's the kind of government intervention to block the fires all over North India and that would create the public good of clean air. Okay? So the, I've described four categories, public goods, asymmetric information, externalities and the market power. These are green lighted by the economists as market failure. And so that basically gives us the toolkit that by default freedom. If you see these four, maybe there is a state intervention that can help. Marvelous, illuminative and I will again tell gentle readers there is a masterpiece available to you at your nearest bookstore called In Service of the Republic by Vijay Kailkar and Ajay Shah of which one eminence is here and I have recorded with both eminences that episode is also going to be linked from the show notes so do check that out. I have a few points to add and sure. I agree with you entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, the few points to add is that one when we say that the default is freedom but sometimes freedom doesn't quite work. Implicit in that statement of freedom doesn't quite work is a utilitarian view that when you say something doesn't work, you mean it, it leads to bad consequences or it doesn't lead to good consequences and etc. And there are those who would argue that freedom is a value in its own right. You know, this is utilitarianism versus deontological, but let's not get into yeah. sort of ethics. We can have a longer episode on it some other time. Yeah. But the idea being some who would say that no, freedom is an absolute value. You don't want to mess with it. Yeah. And my problem with util utilitarianism... And there'll be some who will say freedom is a value that I will trivially crush in the pursuit of my political preferences. Absolutely. Which is what we got to be aware of because my, one of my issues with all utilitarian thinking is that the it assumes that knowledge is easy. Knowledge is not easy. Knowledge is very difficult to come by. Yeah. And utilitarian thinkers will often say, if we do do this, that will happen and they will make these crazy assumptions with their yeah. engineering mindset yeah. and none of that will ever happen. And I, so I'm not saying that we should not consider consequences. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I entirely agree with you, but I'm saying that there should be a really high bar of proof when someone says that freedom isn't working. Yes. The uh, bar of proof should be very high. It should not be something that you can use conveniently yeah. to crush freedom, yeah. which often happens. And I'm going to talk more about that for a mom uh, in a moment. But mm. I also want to say something upside down. Suppose your values were such that you actually didn't care about freedom in, in and of itself. Okay, that's not where I am. That's not where you are. Mm. But suppose you gentle reader actually don't give a damn about freedom, that you don't value freedom. Maybe you're a conservative. Maybe you value order. Maybe you value traditional culture where actually some people should crush the freedom of others. Okay, I will, however, be the card carrying economist and say that this technology of baselining on freedom and limiting state intervention 
to the world of market failure, subject to some more caveats that I'm going to come to in a moment, is the path to prosperity. That's an objective claim that, look, you want to get rich or not. Okay. So while it is entirely true that I believe every good and ethical philosophy is grounded in human freedom and human possibilities, even if not, if you just cared about money, even then, as a card-carrying economist, I'm saying to you that society is flourish when freedom is a baseline and government intervention is limited to the class of market failures where there can be a successful implementation. And I will come to implementation considerations next. Exactly. I entirely agree with you. So, like, I was, in fact, at one point thinking of uh, writing a book, which I never got down to it, talking essentially about freedom, reframed as concern, talking about why it is optimal from both the moral point of view and the utilitarian point of view. You know, it gives you the best results, but even if you don't care about results, you know, etc, etc. Yeah. Um, the other point I wanted to make is about language, that these terms are confusing. Like you pointed out uh, how people get confused about digital public goods mm -hmm. when they're neither rival nor excludable to kaha, uh, you know, uh, public goods. And market failure is another such term. Now, a public good doesn't mean something that is good for the public, yeah. right? Similarly, a market failure doesn't mean when the market fails to give you something you want. Yeah. That I wanted a green cushion, I only found blue cushions at the store, it's a market failure. Yeah. I'm taking a trivial example, but that's how people often think of it. Yeah. So two things, two points here. One is we have to actually think about what a market failure is and the way you, you and I use it is in a slightly different sense. Just because a market doesn't give you doesn't want, uh, something that you want doesn't mean the state should now step in and uh, sort of regulate that. Yeah. And the other important point is that people keep talking about market failure uh, often erroneously to justify state intervention. No one talks of state failure, yeah. you know, and public choice theory is a field and one day I want to do a full episode episode on it, yeah. which essentially elaborates on why state failure is yeah. practically ubiquitous but and I, market failure is I rare. want to classify it under the title implementation constraints and we'll come back. We'll, 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 we'll yeah. kind of come but back the into terminology, this. This is a bane of economics that in the field of economics, we repurpose plain English words. Okay. We don't create fancy new technical terms as we do in science and mathematics. In economics, we repurpose ordinary English words. So market failure, public good, adverse selection, uh, moral hazard. Okay, all these things seem seductively accessible to people who haven't thought deeply about them. And I'll just say that be cautious that in economics, these are used as technical terms. So just take the effort of thoroughly understanding the precise meaning of these terms before using them. And even the confusion between rights and entitlements, for example, and liberal and progressive today often in some places mean the opposite yeah. of what they originally meant. The other minor point I want to make that, that buttresses a larger point I was making earlier is about monopolies. You know, it's fashionable to talk about monopolies, but my sense is that, uh, you know, to the way I look at it is monopolies are incredibly rare to come by in a competitive marketplace. Yeah. Most of the time you see something that is genuinely a monopoly. The state, there is cronyism happening. The state has a, has a hand. It has, you know, stopped uh, ease of entry in some way or the other. Because after all, every businessman and people, again, another mistake people make is they assume that business friendly is equal to market friendly. They're absolutely the opposite. Market friendly means you have competition. Anyone can enter. Business friendly means the existing businesses who are there. They want to keep competitors out, which hurts consumers. Yeah. So they're completely different terms. Now, every big business will want to be a monopoly yeah. and the way and they will lobby the government for it. And they will tell the government to create tariffs, put regulations, this and that. And you want to kind of avoid that. So it, it's it's sort of important to point out that wherever there is a monopoly, like I, I have this mantra that I use, you know, and it consists of four words. It's a question I ask myself whenever I look at a problem out there in society. Where is the coercion? Right. And where you identify the coercion, often, most of the time, in fact, in my case, always, you will find that the root of the problem is there. And where there is what appears to be a monopoly, firstly, it's either not a monopoly, you're defining it wrongly, you're making some category error, uh, or there is state intervention at hand. And the reason I'm saying this is not because I want to say that there are no monopolies or whatever. Of course, there are, they can be, as you, you know, as, as you'll go on to mention, but simply because the world is full of people, especially the state is full of people who are looking to clamp down on freedom using all of these as excuses. And it's important to be on the watch for them and set a really high bar of proof. Yeah. OK.
Okay, let's continue on our journey of the toolkit of public policy. So where we are, we've established that the state is the monopoly on violence. It's a coercive creature and the appropriate role of the state is to play in the space of market failure. For the rest, freedom should be the default. By default, our worldview should be don't tell people what to do. And there is a narrow class of problems that are market failure problems. And so you're all strapped up and ready to go. You want to do public policy. You want to interfere in something in society. You want to intervene. You want to use the coercive power of the state in society where there is a market failure. And I want to say, hold it there. Okay. Do not rush in where angels fear to tread. And this is around the problem of implementation failure. Okay. So just because there's a market failure, it doesn't mean that a state intervention will succeed. Okay. Very many times the state tries to march into something and it becomes a mess. So we should not jump to the conclusion that because there is a market failure, a state intervention is the appropriate pathway to go. So now we should start thinking deeper about the machinery, about how will state intervention be organized? Can it work? Will it work? Will we succeed? Will we fail? In this, there is a nice toolkit on judging how difficult is a problem. Okay. So imagine you and I have a conversation over chai and you know, Amit Bhai is the dictator running the country and uh, we agree that XYZ is a market failure and you wave your royal hand and you say, go intervene in the society and fix it. Okay. So then how do we achieve at a uh, chai conversation level assessment of how hard is this battle going to be? Okay. So, I mean, if I tell you to do an expeditionary force into the Middle East versus an expeditionary force into Japan. Okay. It's obvious that an expeditionary force into Japan is harder because Japan is far away. Okay. Whereas landing a division in the Middle East is easier because it's a short ride across over the Arabian Sea. Okay. So like that, do we have some simple toolkit to assess the complexity of a battle of public policy intervention? One that is so easy to employ that it belongs in every drawing room conversation in the country. And remarkably enough, the answer is yes. Okay. The first two parts of this were built by uh, Pritchett and Woolcock 2004. So Land Pritchett and Michael Woolcock wrote a paper in 2004 where they said, test one, does it involve a large number of transactions? Okay. So if a government has to do many, many things with many, many people all over the country, that's more difficult. If a government just has to do a few things, if the number of decisions, the number of transactions is lower, then it's an easier thing. Whereas if the number of transactions is higher, if you have to pay welfare payments to millions of people, it's more difficult. Okay. So that's dimension one of complexity. High number of transactions makes it more difficult. Okay. Then dimension two is their discretion. Okay. If there's a high amount of discretion for some frontline civil servant, then it's more difficult because there's going to be more corruption. If there's less amount of discretion, then it's easier. Okay. So to put these two together, for example, a government run vaccination program has a high number of transactions, but low amount of discretion. Okay. A polio vaccine, you just walk in the slum or in the village and just put the polio drop on everybody. There is nothing. There is no Aadhaar number, there's no tracking of identity, there's nothing, there's no discretion, there's no complexity. So that's an easy rollout because there is no discretion for the frontline operator. They just have to obey a manual and go roll out all over the country doing smallpox vaccinations, doing polio vaccinations. Okay, so that's two dimensions proposed by Woolcock and Pritchett. Kelkar and I have thought a lot about this and we think that two more dimensions in this are required. Dimension three, the stakes. Okay, so when a school teacher gets a job in a government school and doesn't show up to teach, she's stealing 15,000 rupees a month from the government because that's the wage of a school teacher. So what is at stake? 15,000 rupees. Okay, so yeah, people will try to steal that 15,000 rupees, but the amount of effort that will go into misbehavior will be relatively limited. At the other extreme, you have high stakes situations like in a criminal justice system where somebody is accused of a crime. And now the behavior of the policeman, the behavior of the public prosecutor, the behavior of the judge in all these things, because the accused is facing a life and death consequence of going to jail, the stakes are sky high and then the dangers of corruption and discretion just go to infinity. 
as the stakes go up, you take income tax, you take financial regulation, you take criminal justice system, you take judiciary, in all these things, the stakes are very high. So it is very, very difficult to build a rule of law environment where a policeman, a public prosecutor, a judge will be even handed, treat everybody identically. Okay, so that's dimension three. That's the stakes. That when the stakes are high, things are more difficult. When the stakes are low, the things are less difficult. Finally, fourth is secrecy. Wherever there is more secrecy, it will be more difficult. Okay, so wherever a government activity operates under complete transparency, there'll be more check and balance that more people will notice when there's misbehavior and malfeasance. So while there is a lot of admiration and respect for the military, it is also the case that the military is shrouded in secrecy and that's likely to be the cover for a lot of state failure. The things are going to be done wrong and done badly inside military affairs. Famously, we have seen in Putin's invasion of Russia, once the shooting started, we realized that there were mind-blowing failures inside the Russian military, which were all covered up in the normal pompous parades and nationalism and militarism. So that is the fourth dimension, that is secrecy. Wherever there is more secrecy, it is more difficult to build a government system that will achieve capability. So in short, Chai conversation by the great dictator Amit Bhai, whenever a government intervention is proposed, Amit Bhai asks his people four questions. That, is there a large number of transactions? Yes, no. Is there discretion in the frontline staff? Yes, no. Is there, are the stakes high, low? Effectively a yes, no. And... Is there secrecy? Yes, no. In these four zero one numbers, you've got a grip of the essence that some things are easy, some things are hard. Straight away, right there, you know that am I facing an easy problem? Am I facing a difficult problem? Enormously impressive, but I have to tell you, I'm also enormously offended because you keep saying the great dictator Amit Bhai. Let me tell you something. Mr. Shah is a great dictator. Mr. Shah with his authoritarian command over facts. Mr. Shah with his oppression of bad ideas. You are the problem here. Let me tell you that. And by the way, you forgot, uh, as Mr. Shah, uh, Shahs tend to forget, you forgot one, uh, you know, impressive aspect of your book where, uh, and um, again, extremely wise words where you pointed out that if there are 10 ways to intervene. Yeah. Choose the least oppressive. Yeah. Optimize for freedom. Yeah. So there's this very subtle thing that not enough people are worrying about, which is uh, what is the least intrusive intervention? So suppose there's a market failure and you can solve it through 10 different methods. First of all, it behoves policymakers and the public policy community and the citizenry to consider, are there five ways of doing this? There doesn't have to be only one way. And each of the different ways will generally have a different political economy around it. There'll be some gainers and losers and so on. And then the most important question to ask is that a good intervention is one that is that is the least intrusive in the lives of people. Okay, so again, the liberal dream, the liberal idea is that I should live my life on my terms. I should be lost in my reverie. I should live on my terms. I should not need to think or know about the state or anybody telling me do this, do that. So nobody should tell me what to do. That is the liberal dream. So a government that interferes more in the lives of people and that engages in bigger intrusions is less good compared to a government that addresses market failure in more subtle ways, in more uh, behind the scenes ways where less people and less intrusions are pushed into the lives of people. And again, there's a little bit of a cute economics technical idea that the lowest cost intrusion is found by going to the root cause. So when there is an air quality disaster all over North India, don't build hospitals. Solve it at the root cause, clean the air. Okay. So don't build bad roads and then put a trauma center at every highway exit. Build good roads. Okay, so go to the root cause. Solve things at the root cause. That's the lowest cost intervention that society will benefit from. But on top of this, I also think there is a political philosophy. There's a moral philosophy problem. When there are many different interventions, which one will you judge to be the least intrusive? So, you know, for example, you will agree with any rule where I will say that if the state or a state employee touches a human body, that's a higher intervention than an intervention that does not touch a human body. An intervention that knocks on my door is worse than an intervention that does not knock on my door. An intervention that enters my house is less good compared to an intervention where the civil servant stands at my door. Okay, and so on. So we could think of many ways in which we could start developing a philosophy around what is more intrusive, 
what is less intrusive and it's an important piece of our toolkit that we should bring into this problem. And I'll just think aloud and I'll say that, you know, when you talk about finding the root cause, what is also therefore important here is that government is as local and distributed as possible. So another example, which I got from episodes on centrally sponsored schemes in public policy with Pranay Kutasane, uh, did an episode with Nilakanta Naris on his book on South India, is that the needs of the North and the South are so different, but the priorities of the North dictate public policy. For example, Kerala has a problem of diabetes and obesity. And by the way, gentle reader, check out our diabetes episode, we can conquer diabetes, yes we can. But uh, you know, the South has a problem with diabetes and uh, obesity, whereas other parts of India in the North um, and, and Central India ha ha has a problem with malnourishment, like Bihar has a huge problem with that. And you would imagine that you have, uh, you know, health budgets given to different states and locally it is decided what is the best way to tackle that particular problem. But when you have centrally sponsored government schemes, and I don't remember the name of the exact scheme, etc, etc, but all of these central schemes are designed in Delhi and they're calculated for solving the nearby problem yeah. and therefore not understanding local needs. So government should, of course, be as local as possible. Yeah. I, I want to introduce a beautiful principle here and a buzzword. Uh, the principle is called the subsidiarity principle. And uh, this is a, one of the great ideas in economics, which asserts that every problem in government should be placed at the lowest level of government where it can be placed. That's a brilliant idea. And you said one of the great principles in economics, you often say this. Mm -hmm. So now I want to ask you, how many are there? Oh, okay. One of the greatest means, how many are there? are many, many. But for our present journey, yeah. okay, what I feel we've put together here between the previous episode and this one is that basic toolkit about how to think about public policy. Okay, That what is the role of the state? Where should the state try to work? And not taking implementation uh, success for granted. In fact, respecting the implementation challenge. It is very difficult to make state intervention work. There are some ways to think about putting it at subnational government subsidiarity principle. Think about the level of complexity of a given problem. Maybe some things are easy, maybe some things are hard and it should shape our judgment. We should be willing to walk away. Just because there's a market failure, it doesn't mean that the government needs to be there intervening. You need to ask can we succeed? Can we win at correctly addressing that market failure in a low cost way? Otherwise, we just create some government bureaucracy, some corrupt system, some bunch of uh, state functionaries who are kicking around private people. Then that's not helping. That's actually harming. So I feel we should be very thoughtful and self-aware that over and over and over state intervention goes bad. There's no guarantee of success. Occasionally, state intervention can work. And so we should be skeptical and thoughtful and attempt some, but not all, kinds of state intervention and be self-aware to understand that this ain't working and then back away. So living with a market failure is often better than living with a bad state intervention that claims to address that market failure and oftentimes fails to address it. There's this great line from Yes Minister or was it Yes Prime Minister, both series written by Jonathan Lynn and Anthony Jay, which is, you know, uh, we must do something, this is something, therefore we must do this, yeah. right? So the two things to think of is that you don't always have to do something and if you're doing something, is it the right thing to do is question one yeah. and nevertheless do you need to do it is question two because the capacity of government is limited. Yeah. You can't try to solve every problem in the yeah. world and in India we haven't solved the basic problems of rule of law and etc, etc. And there is that other economic concept of opportunity cost that comes into play. That listen, government has limited capacity, limited money, limited bandwidth. You need to think about what are the core priorities. And then you need to think about, hey, we don't need to go in stepping in everywhere. Yeah. And that brings me to the whole issue of learning by doing. Okay, how do states emerge? Did the immense scope of the Swedish state emerge pristine into the world? Of course not. Okay, Nobody can build the Swedish state overnight. It takes hundreds of years. So what we know from history is that in every advanced economy, the capability of running a state correctly took hundreds of years. Nothing got done quickly. It takes a long time to learn to do public management that all the difficulties that we have enumerated make it very difficult to run a state correctly. So it's always wise to start with a very low scope, start with a few narrow 
problems and maybe for one or two generations just learn how to do those few things so in uh, europe in the 17th 18th and 19th centuries all that happened was that the state learned how to have a fiscal system so as to raise money for taxes and uh, wage war which meant a surrounding machinery of the scientific and technological stuff around arms and contracting and all that so basically that was all that was going on the governments were about a public finance system the so called fiscus and a war system that's what they did it took hundreds of years but around that they learned how to be a state they learned hr they learned contracting they learned checks and balances they learned how to control corruption they learned how to solve principal agent problems they learned how to keep the foggy guys in their barracks and not interfering inside a liberal democracy okay all these rich complex lessons the hard won lessons were then available as state capability which could then be applied to new problems such as vaccines so it is important to do this learning by doing and then start with a narrow scope do a few things learn how to be a state which is my opinion for where we are in india for 25 years for 50 years we have to learn how to do basics and then at the end of that depending on the political preferences of that society you could think about whether you want to broaden the scope so i take a pragmatic approach that i don't think it's a useful debate in india to do more welfareism to do less welfareism you know when there are burning basic problems like the police and the judiciary that are waiting to be solved and you know you mentioned sweden so i want to kind of butt in here and talk about how people will often ask that look at the sweden look at the scandinavian countries you know you talk about the importance of freedom but welfare states and all of that which is true but couple of points i want to make there number one that while they do have significant welfare states they also have great individual liberty they don't get in the way of the citizens it is so easy to start a business in those countries relative to what it is here mm -hmm. uh, you know so they don't intervene so much that's important to note and the second point is they became rich before they became welfareers the great writer johan norberg has a bunch of writings on this we'll link the relevant ones from the show notes where he talks about this in great detail about how they were in fact model free market economies of the side you and i ajay shah would really enjoy mm -hmm. uh, and 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 after the, they did that then they had the luxury to you know build uh, once the state capacity was there to do uh, all of these things yeah. so, uh, i always love to say <clears throat> uh, swedish levels of the cashless economy is backed by swedish levels of rule of law and so you know we should always worry about the rest of the environment in which a certain thing is being done okay so i'm at the end of uh, this main story and i just want to say to the gentle reader that between two episodes we've tried to give you the outlines of a toolkit on how to think about government the state the fundamental political foundations of why we bring this coercive creature into our life it's not an ngo it's not a nice guy it's not a mother it's a coercive creature with its own self interest and they seek to have power over us and our problem is a finding that right balance where the state is addressing market failure and not interfering in our lives and we need to understand that state intervention is messy and failure prone and we need to cautiously explore some areas some low complexity problems where with a narrow scope for two generations india can learn to become like sweden of 100 years ago that would be a pretty good thing and this is a general toolkit it's a technology that can be applied into many other areas and in a couple of future episodes we will show this toolkit in action where we will take one problem after another and apply this kind of thinking and it's just it's an elevated level of strategic thinking in public policy Ajay before we go on to the next chapter I have good news for you to tell So here's the deal uh, we have a sponsor for this episode <laughs> surprise surprise it's a Pune Public Policy Festival uh, which is happening on January 19th and January 20th in Pune and it's pretty exciting because Pune once upon a time was a intellectual hub of India it was called the Oxford of the East you had great educational institutions you had a great discourse you had tremendous ferment out there and the base kind of shifted away especially after independence delhi became the capital of the country so people think hey you want to talk about public policy you got to go to delhi to do it and you know everything is so central and maybe that changing a little bit maybe the center of gravity is changing a little bit and pune is organizing this great festival where young professional 
officials will interact with experts in public policy with bureaucrats with economists with thinkers uh, and the particular theme for this festival is trade offs you know the trade offs between environment and growth the trade offs between growth and equality the trade offs between technology and privacy a lot of the sort of dilemmas that we face in modern times so if you are there or thereabouts or you have the free time and can make it there you know you'll see a link on the you'll see the url on the screen and the link in the show notes so register for the pune public policy uh, festival anything to build a healthy discourse So Ajay, what book should we read to understand all this better? Apart from, of course, that obscure book by those that Kelkar and Shah guy. I you may have heard me talk about this book before, but I will do it all over again. This is Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott, and this book is a rumination around the problem that it is hard for the state to see. You and I are individuals, and we see certain things. We assess. facts about the universe in a certain way it's very difficult for institutions and bureaucracies to see further when the state sees the people it often inflicts cruelty and violence upon them so it's a skeptical look at improving state legibility and for example around the whole digital debates uh kelkar and i use the phrase premature state legibility riffing on the word state legibility as used in seeing like a state so this is a great cautionary book which helps us think more about the individual and the state and their fraught relationship and amit tell us your recommendation for today so my recommendation for today is this book Cicada by Sean Tan, great illustrator, great writer, great artist. This was, uh, you know, recommended to me first in an episode I did with Priya Matthews and Gunjan Grover, um, episode of the Seen and the Unseen on uh, motherhood, and then I and this particular copy is borrowed from Namsita or Cinemat as she calls herself and editor, and it's just a marvelous book. I won't say anything about it. I'll just say, look, I'm recommending it. Me. me who doesn't recommend too many things actually i do but it's a great book so check it out and before we end i also want to say that uh, you know in the in the same vein of you know the way you talk about economics i want to say that you ajay shah are one of the greatest hosts of everything is everything how did i become a host you are one of the greatest hosts <laughs> 